officially welcome everyone to Habitat Gardening for Butterflies. Uh, my name is Kristen Barker. I'm the Community Education Coordinator here at CalBG, and I'm really happy and glad to be joined by Evan Green, who I'll kind of hand you over to in a minute here. Um, but before I do, I just like to kind of go over the format of the, the webinar. I'm sure most, if not all of us, are very familiar with Zoom at this point. So I probably, this is probably redundant, but just in case, um, you know, I encourage everyone to use the Q&A if you have any questions throughout Evan's talk. Uh, we'll be able to kind of pause periodically to address some of those. Um, but don't worry if your question doesn't get addressed right away. I may just be holding on to it for another section of his talk or maybe holding on to it till the end where we'll have a little bit more time to go over any additional questions you may have. Um, I'll kind of along those same lines, I encourage everyone to use the chat. We kind of got that started. It's a nice way to connect with both Evan and myself, but if you want to connect with other people in taking the class, if you look at your chat box, there's a little blue bar and it by default, we'll say two panelists. If you drop down that blue bar, it'll say two panelists and attendees. And that's a nice way to kind of connect with other people taking the class. So I suggest you do that if you'd like to kind of chat with each other. Um, and then also we are recording this. So if you, you know, have to step away for a moment or, you know, you, you didn't get the name of a uh, book written down perfectly, don't worry. Um, it, we post this on our digital content page of our website, which is calbg.org. So you typically can find that there by the end of the day today. If not, um, I definitely will have it up by the end of the day on Monday. And then lastly, I typically will send out a follow-up email after the class. I'm sure Evan's going to mention lots of resources and books and websites and things like that. So don't, don't fret if you can't you know, write it down perfectly. I'll send you a, a follow-up email with all those links and um, book, titles of books and things. So you'll have that from me after the class. And so with that, I'm going to hand you over to Evan. Evan is a, a horticulturalist here at the garden. He maintains kind of a wide area of, of this, this beautiful garden, um, you know, ranging from oak woodland to chaparral to coastal sage scrub to, I think, a pine area, pine tree area. So he has a breadth of knowledge kind of coming into this and is very passionate about connecting wildlife and um, our native plants here at the garden. So I'm very happy and glad to have him with us. And with that, I'm going to hand you over to Evan. Evan, thanks again for being here. Yeah, no problem. Um, great. So hello, everybody. Uh, thanks for tuning in. Um, again, I'm Evan. I work as a horticulturist here. And um, yeah, today we're going to be talking about butterfly gardening, uh, specifically with California native plants. Um, in the background here, you can see a nice big mass of uh, whirly blue sage, which is in a pretty close to where I'm sitting right now, and a pretty uh, popular spot, especially with swallowtail butterflies. Um, yeah, and I'd like to know, um, I'm really curious, butterfly gardening is a very place-specific activity, and I'm curious to know where everyone um, tuning in is tuning in from. So if, if, if you'd like to, you know, put in the chat where you're tuning in from, and uh, and we can check in later and uh, see where everyone uh, uh, has their garden. So, okay, I'm going to jump right into it. And this talk is going to be organized. I'm going to start out talking a little bit of a little bit of background on butterflies and um, their biology, and then we'll go into um, you know some, the the biggest butterfly families and some of the most common butterflies you might find around here. Then we'll talk a little bit about butterfly gardening principles kind of in general. And then we'll do like profiles of the best nectar plants and plants for caterpillars, okay? So let's get started. So yeah, why butterfly gardening? I know I don't have to convince most of you, you're taking a class on butterfly gardening, um, but it's, you know, it's, it can be really fun and very rewarding, right? Um, butterflies are, you know, the ambassadors of the insect world, right? They're they're very easy to love. They're some of the cutest insects to a lot of people, right? Um, you know, I haven't heard of too many beetle gardening or cockroach gardening classes, right? Butterflies are just, are beautiful. They're fun to watch, fun to observe, and um, it can be very rewarding to create habitats for them and know that you're helping them out, right? Uh, it's a great thing to do with kids, a great thing to do as a family. Um, 
learning about insects and observing insects is a great pathway for kids um, towards a developing a love of nature and uh, being great environmental stewards and appreciating nature, right? Um, yeah, and you're helping to boost uh, butterfly and not just butterflies, but other pollinator populations, right? All of these butterfly plants that we'll talk about today also um, uh, harbor all sorts of other pollinators and other um, insects, as well as birds and other wildlife, right? So you're helping out bees, beneficial wasps, uh, birds that come to eat the seeds after the flowers are done, all of that. So you're really helping wildlife in general. And I'll try to uh, mention things other than butterflies that the plants we talk about are good for attracting. Um, and then you might wonder, yeah, why, why native plants, right? Why use native plants when, you know, you could plant, say, lantana or something else that butterflies also like? Um, native plants are the best for supporting locally native species and for supporting the greatest diversity of pollinators and other invertebrates, right? Native plants and native animals have co-evolved over millennia. Um, so with native plants, you know you're giving the proper nourishment to, to these pollinators um, and specifically butterflies. So we're gonna talk a little bit now about uh, butterfly biology. So yeah, what exactly is a butterfly? I thought I knew um, and I, I was a little bit mistaken. So along with um, moths, butterflies share the order Lepidoptera in um, the class Insecta, which is insects, right? So they're an insect and they share, yeah, Lepidoptera with the moths. Um, so butterflies and moths combined, they're about 180,000 species. That's 10% of all known organisms. So one in 10 living things is a butterfly or moth or known living things at least, right? And um, so butterflies form their own super family. And um, there are about 18,000 species total. And the rest of Lepidoptera, like 160,000 species are moths. So eight times as many types of moths as butterflies. Um, in the US, we have about 750 species, about 200 in California, and then 170 uh, species of butterflies or thereabouts in Southern California. So yeah, some differences for moths. Um, butterflies are usually diurnal. Moths are mostly nocturnal. Um, their antennae have little uh, thickened clubs on the ends. In moths, the antennae are um, thread-like or feathery. Butterflies are usually brightly colored, although not always. And they tend to hold their wings vertically overhead while at rest, like this. Whereas moths will lay them down flat or lay them back over their bodies. And yeah, like all other insects, three part, um, three sectioned body, head, thorax, and abdomen in the head. Uh, as part of the head, they've got their two antennae, two compound eyes, which are made up of thousands of individual lenses, and then a proboscis, the big uh, sucking mouth part. That's kind of like a giant straw or giant to a butterfly anyway. Um, and their thorax is divided into three different segments. Each of those segments has a pair of legs. Um, and then that's where the two forewings, the front wings, and the two hind wings, the back wings, are attached. And um, the abdomen contains the sex organs, the digestive, and the excretory systems. So in this uh, picture on the left of this monarch, you can see, the, hopefully you can see those thickened club-like ends on the antennae. And then you can see that slightly unfurled proboscis. So that's the sucking mouth part that uses to suck nectar out of flowers. On the right, you can see a kind of a close-up of that compound eye. You can even kind of make out the individual um, lenses. So we all remember this probably from, you know, like first or second grade um, science. Uh, butterflies under, undergo a complete metamorphosis, meaning that each life stage looks completely different from all the others. And uh, yeah, obviously they go from, most of us know this, they go from uh, an egg hatch out as a caterpillar, which is basically an eating machine. Uh, its job is to get enough uh, res uh, uh, food storage reserves in order to make it through the uh, pupal stage. Um, yeah, then it makes a pupa, which with a butterfly we call a chrysalis, and then emerges as a butterfly. And that whole process from egg laying to emerging as an adult butterfly takes like typically one to two months. And um, as far as a butterfly senses, they, and this is important for butterfly gardening, they mostly rely on senses other than sight. Um, females 
use their feet to taste plants in order to find one that's chemically um, compatible for their larvae in order to lay their eggs on it. And um, in terms of a butterfly site, they can't resolve images. They can't see images very clearly, but unlike us, they can see the ultraviolet part of the electromagnetic spectrum. So that because of that, and this is true of bees as well, I believe, a lot of flowers have ultraviolet um, nectar guides. So these are markings that guide the pollinator to where the nectar is in the flowers. And we can't see these because we can't see ultraviolet. So these are a couple flowers um, photographed using UV light. So on the left, you can see, this is a California Fremontia, uh, Fremontia. You can see the pink and blue, pink and blue. Those are the nectar guides. And on the right, we have a, a dandelion. Top photo is under regular light. Bottom photo is under UV light. And there's a big bullseye where all that nectar is in the center of the flower. So a little bit of um, butterfly behavior. So males will often make, uh, create and defend territories. And they'll sometimes even defend these from people. If you've ever been chased by a butterfly, you're in its territory, that's what's going on. They, males will also take part in these aerial dog fights, um, these aerial battles. So you'll, you know, most of us have probably seen that happen as well. And when mating, you know, butterflies will sometimes connect their tails and will even fly that way for sometimes for a long period of time. And um, another fact that's really important for butterfly gardening, butterflies are cold blooded and will often bask to get up to flying temperature. So they can't fly unless they're in a, a certain range of temperature. It's something like 75 to 110 for their internal wing muscles. And so they need to bask They'll often bask in the morning to get up to that temperature. So yeah, and as we know, most butterflies eat nectar, right? But some, especially butterflies that hibernate, tend to eat tree sap, rotting fruit, um, manure, carrion, and even human sweat. If you've ever had a butterfly land on you when you visited a butterfly house or something, that's sometimes what's happening. If you're sweaty, you're especially attractive to butterflies because they want that salt. Oops. Oops. Um, another behavior butterflies often engage in is called puddling. So especially males do this, they'll hang out by water or uh, by wet soil or mud, and they suck the minerals and salts um, out of that mud that they can't get for nectar. And a few strategies males use to find mates, um, there are perchers who will just wait in a spot and wait for a female to go by. And then there are patrollers, which will fly a route over and over, either back and forth, or I'm not sure if they do it in a circle, but that's called patrolling. They'll keep going on their route until they see a female. And um, related to those behaviors is hilltopping. So swallowtails do this. Um, I'm not sure what other butterflies do it, but a lot of other insects do it as well. Hilltopping is where butterflies hang out. Um, so males will go hang out on a hilltop. And females know that that's the spot to go meet a mate if they're receptive. And so you can go to hills in places like Arizona, I've read elsewhere, uh, where there are insects of all kinds all mating on top of the hill to, at the same time. So yeah, if you ever see that happening, that's what's going on, okay? Um, so yeah, here's a, some, a swallowtail I caught uh, puddling in the garden, a, what I believe is a pale swallowtail. And so this is just the irrigation water that, um, that uh, missed the bed and flowed to this little like muddy spot. And yeah, he hung out there for a while, uh, uh, you know, getting those minerals. So um, in terms of defense, a lot of butterflies are brightly colored as a warning to predators that they're poisonous or don't taste good, right? And they also have a lot of uh, butterflies have markings that confuse pet predators. Those are the things like the eye spots or tails that makes it look like the back of the butterfly is the head. So a predator will attack the back instead of the front. And it's more likely to survive an attack. Uh, caterpillars may feed at night to avoid predators or some are camouflaged. They look like bird poop or, or you know, are just very hard to spot. Some caterpillars also are covered in spines which makes them hard to eat. It also makes it hard for um, predatory wasps to lay their eggs on them because they want to lay their predatory wasps, uh, or sorry, parasitic wasps lay their eggs on caterpillars, and then their um, offspring hatch and 
eat the caterpillar, right? So yeah, caterpillars want to avoid that as best they can. Okay, so we're gonna do a quick run through of some of the, um, the major butterfly families. Um, and I'll mention some of the more common or notable species of butterflies in these families you might find um, in Southern California. So the swallowtails, um, family Papillionidae. These are like the largest butterflies you'll find around here. Um, an interesting behavior with them is that they often flutter while they're drinking nectar, which is really interesting. Most butterflies just hold their wings together, but the, the swallowtails will flutter. Maybe it's because they're bigger and they need more help with balance. Um, so I've read. Uh, on the top, we have the Western tiger swallowtail. This is kind of more of a, a yellow color. And um, on the bottom, we have the pale swallowtail. Very similar looking. It's a little hard to tell in this picture, but it's, it's a very, very pale yellow, like more of a creamy cream with a hint of yellow. So they're very similar looking, but the pale swallowtail is much lighter in color. And here's, a, I believe, a, a Western giant swallowtail um, nectaring on a California buckeye. And yeah, this was, this was taken in the garden recently. So we've been seeing um, a lot of swallowtails on that uh, California buckeye. Um, family uh, Pieridae is the whites and sulfurs. Whites are typically white butterflies, at least have some white coloration, and the sulfurs are typically yellow or some variety of yellow, have some yellow. The cabbage white on the top here, this is a butterfly you'll see on your kale plants if you ever uh, garden, uh, uh, grow vegetables. They love to, the caterpillars love to eat kale, cabbage, plants like that. On the bottom, orange sulfur, um, their host plant is our legumes, so bean family plants. Got the Becker's white on the left, another, you know, a, a different variation of white butterfly. You can see some of that um, light marbling on the underside of the wing. Um, their host plant is the bladder pod, our native bladder pod, as well as mustard family plants. On the right, we have the California dog face, which is actually not just a state butterfly, but our state insect. This is a type of sulfur um, and their host plant is false indigo, the amorpha, a native plant that we'll talk about later. But you can see in this picture, this is a male here. You can see where my cursor is. And the males have this design of a dog's face on a dark background as part of their the top side of their forewing, which is kind of cool. Yeah, it, it looks like a strange looking dog, but yeah, kind of like a dog, right? Um, so coppers, blues, and hair streaks, this family, um, the family Lycanidae, these are typically very small butterflies, less than two inches, often less than an inch. So on the top, we have the gray hair streak. These are one of the most common butterflies in North America. Um, been seeing a lot of those in the garden. And on the bottom, we have the marine blue, another fairly common one around here. This flies in Southern California throughout the year. And the top side is blue, while the bottom has this kind of uh, banding. Oops. So here you see a gray hair streak on uh, our native crown beard, uh, Verbicina, in the garden here. And um, yeah, family Nymphalidae, these are the brush footed butterflies. This is a lot of our most iconic, best known, most popular butterflies like the monarch painted ladies. Um, they're called brush foots because their front pair of legs are brush like and very small. It basically looks like they have just four legs. And so, yeah, these include the monarch, the morning cloak, which is one of those butterflies that feeds on rotting fruit, you know, sap, animal, scat, instead of nectar. So trying to get a picture of these, they're a little bit hard to chase down because they don't stop at flowers. They will uh, land sometimes on the ground or on shrubs, um, but yeah, they don't tend to really drink flower nectar. And here I got some, you know, sort of fuzzy shots of the morning cloaks in the, the garden here recently. So there, there are a lot of them around right now. Uh, a few more uh, nymphalids. On the left, we have the Red Admiral. My coworker Muriel got a great shot of this, again, on the California Buckeye Nectaring. And these are related to Painted Ladies, same genus. On the right, we have the California Sister, which is a butterfly that uses oaks as its host plant for its caterpillars. So wherever you have oaks, you tend to have these around. 
And it's named for the fact that its pattern kind of look like, looks like a nun's habit, supposedly. Um, you know, an abstract, you know, in an abstract way, I guess. Um, so interesting fact. And um, our last uh, butterfly family, um, this is the skippers, the family Hesperiidae. Skippers tend to kind of almost look a bit like moths. They're very fat bodied, very fuzzy bodied, have kind of big heads, big eyes. On the top, we have the fiery, and they tend to be fairly small, one to two inches. Um, generally not quite as small as the uh, coppers, blues, and hair streaks. On the top, we have fiery skipper. This is more of an urban butterfly. You can see it here nectaring on lantana, uh, a non-native plant. And their host plant is grasses. So they, uh, especially Bermuda grass. So they have followed people kind of wherever there are a lot of lawns, you get a lot of, uh, a lot of them. On the bottom, you have the funereal dusky wing, which is a kind of a bigger skipper. So like an inch and a half. And um, we've been seeing a lot of these in the garden lately. So here's a, a Northern checkered skipper I, I spotted in the garden. Well, at least that's my best guess. Uh, it's on its host plant, which is uh, bush mallow, Malacothamnus. And then funereal dusky wings are everywhere right now. They're on coyote mint, they're on uh, Philadelphus, they're on this uh, verbicina, the crown beard. So there, uh, there are a lot of them right now. They're one of the most common butterflies right now around here anyway. Yeah, so now we're gonna talk a, bit, a little bit about, um, and maybe uh, we'll break, I don't know if anyone has any questions about um, what we've discussed so far. And then we'll get into the uh, butterfly gardening section of the, the class. There's not questions just yet, but okay. um, we did get a lot of our, where everyone's joining us oh, from. Oh, great, so great. The nice range from here in Claremont and Laverne, and um, you know, San Dimas kind of in this general area, but then also Colton and Central Orange County, okay. Tarzana and Encinitas and Walnut, California. Okay. So relatively local, so. Okay, good. This talk is tailored more to Southern California. So that's, um, that's good, really. Um, yeah. Great. Although, you know, all are welcome, right? Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah so now, now we'll uh, talk a little bit about sort of the principles, general principles of butterfly gardening and creating a backyard habitat for butterflies. Um, yeah, so let's uh, dive right in. So some things to keep in mind when creating a butterfly garden, um, just keep observing and paying attention to where you see butterflies, what, butter, what plants you see them on. Um, it's, you know, fun and uh, I find it interesting at least to uh, identify uh, what you're seeing, identify the, you know, native plants you might see them on. So if you can, um, do you have any, <clears throat> you can come here to the garden and observe butterflies or any, you know, front yard habitats in your neighborhood, you know, front yard native gardens are becoming more and more popular or any, you know, public gardens or other botanic gardens near you. Um, just check it out and see what you find see what you see butterflies on, um, you know, trust your own eyes above all else, right? Um, some of you a little farther away, you know, these same plants, your observations might be different than what we've seen here, right? Um, so yeah, um, just keep observing. Um, the website uh, Calflora is really helpful for identifying native plants that you see, that you may see out when hiking or something and observing butterflies. Um, and Calscape, which will be in the resources at the end, also uh, will tell you what plants host what butterflies. So you can look up a plant and find its butterfly, um, butterflies that it hosts, and you can look up a butterfly and find the plants that it uses. So that can be really helpful to know what you're looking at and to uh, yeah, figure out host plants. Um, yeah, and then you just want to do your best to provide for a butterfly's needs and hope they show up. It's um, some people describe it as like, planning a huge party, sending out your invitations, and um, just, you know, hoping people show up. You, you can't force people to come to your party, right? <laughs> um, yeah, and butterflies really vary in uh, terms of population year to year um, and within the year. So different butterflies fly at different times of the year. So that's something to keep in mind. Different butterflies may have their season, so yeah, pay attention to these things and, um, and, uh, and see how that changes uh, through the years. 
So a butterfly's basic needs um, to have the ideal habitat are sun, plants for nectar, uh, food plants for larvae, for caterpillars to eat, uh, protection from wind, a puddling spot, like we mentioned earlier, a spot to sip minerals out of uh, mud or shallow water, um, a basking spot to warm up, and um, avoidance of pesticides. So we'll go, we'll talk about each of these um, currently. Yeah, so sun is best for a butterfly garden. Some of the plants we'll talk about today can take a bit more shade, but just be aware that during those times of the day when they're in shade, butterflies are less likely to use them. I see butterflies in like part shade using plants, but sun is best. So, you know, a full sun spot, like if you're, if you're, you know, have a really shady spot, it's probably not going to attract a lot of butterflies. Um, but yeah, full sun is best. So that gives the butterflies more time to fly and do everything they need to do, uh, getting nectar, laying eggs, et cetera. That gives them an advantage. And um, warmer temps are, temperatures are also better for the caterpillars. They'll develop faster. As far as nectar plants, um, some species favor specific species or families, but butterflies are not as picky about their nectar plants as their larval host plants. And a lot of the best butterfly attractors are in the sunflower, um, Asteraceae and mint uh, Lamiaceae families. And um, especially because some of the flowers in these families um, are actually compound flowers with lots of little, um, like for example, the sunflower family, the flowers are compound and have many little florets. So a butterfly can land there, they have a nice landing spot and they can sip nectar from many, many, many small flowers at the same time. So it's very efficient for them. Um, same is true for like coyote mint in the mint family. And um, the nectar plants are, will attract more butterflies if they're planted in masses. So not a single plant, but in a cluster. That's better for catching the eye of butterflies that don't see very well at long distance. So that flash of that one color catches their eye better and attracts them better. And it's best with these nectar plants to vary height, uh, color, and the bloom period. So you're trying to aim for, yeah, and this is because butterfly, different types of butterflies prefer different heights to feed at. Um, they fly at different times of the year. And well, maybe they prefer different colors, I don't know. <laughs> Probably, right? Um, and so yeah, for the uh, ideal butterfly garden, you're trying to aim for flowers throughout the season, spring to fall. And some butterflies are even active here in winter. So here's an example of massing. Here is a big mass of California buckwheat in the garden. And in the background, a plant we'll talk about later, we have California buckeye. So you can see that this mass is just a buzz with uh, especially the little blue butterflies and um, all kinds of other pollinators. And here you see, uh, this is kind of like a typical perennial border. So these aren't native plants, but it illustrates the idea of mixing colors and mixing heights. So this sort of perennial border style of design lends itself very well to butterfly garden. So with larval food plants, this is really how you get a lot more butterflies in a butterfly garden because you're attracting the egg laying females and the males looking for mates. Um, and as far as choosing what to grow, you can start with nectar plants, leaving some space, wait and see who shows up and then grow those butterfly specific uh, larval host plants. Or you can just include some from the get go and you know, hope that butterflies find them. Uh, plenty of those plants are also great for other pollinators. Some of them are even great for butterflies, uh, for nectar. And a lot of commonly grown California natives are host plants for some butterfly and often a lot of species of moth, since there's so many more moths than butterflies. And um, for choosing what to grow, Calscape, again, is a really good resource. And um, yeah, again, that's included in the list of resources at the end. And with larval plants, it's the opposite of um, nectar plants. You want to scatter them instead of massing because female butterflies want to lay their eggs um, scattered so that the, the uh, caterpillars don't compete with each other. 
And don't worry too much about your plants getting, you know, wiped out. Predators generally step in, birds and parasitic wasps to keep the population under control. And um, yeah, most of any of us who have done it, uh, any vegetable gardening, gardening know the signs of a caterpillar, but you're looking for uh, chewed leaves and um, the fraps, the droppings. And some types also will feed in big, larger groups. So here you see, this is a woolly pod milkweed. Uh, in the garden here at CBG. And um, my coworker told me he had seen some caterpillars on this. I went to go find them and I, I just kept lo looking and looking and looking, could not find them. And then finally noticed this just partially chewed leaf here and a little bit of frass that had dropped down into this leaf here. And yeah, but could not find it. Kept looking and looking and could not find the caterpillar. So I'm not sure what happened. But uh, this is a host to um, the monarch. So wind protection is really important. Butterflies um, don't like to be in too windy of a spot because it cools them and it you know, wastes their energy. So best to protect, uh, pick a protected spot for your butterfly garden or create some wind protection. And plants are great to use as hedges, specifically some of the large native shrubs such as ceanothus, toyon, lemonade berry. Um, these make excellent hedges that can, and um, these also host some uh, butterflies and, and uh, moths. Um, but yeah, these can work really well as uh, wind protection. Just be mindful that you're not blocking the sun. A puddling spot can be really nice to include in a butterfly garden as well. And this can be anything from a full on pond with just nice shallow edges where the mud or or sand can stay uh, soaked, because that's especially where a butterfly likes to sip. Or you can use a shallow tray or a saucer um, set into the garden in a sunny spot. This is especially good if you're gonna put some salt in the water, because you don't want that salt to seep into your soil and, um, and salt your plants and salt your earth. So um, like a, a, um, a glazed tray or saucer uh, can be great for this. And it just needs to have moisture and be in sun. And yeah, again, uh, or uh, a little bit of salt. And if you can get a, a little bit of horse manure to miss it, mix in there, uh, that can make it really irresistible to the butterflies who are looking for those, uh, those salts and those other nutrients. So here are some examples of, of puddling spots. So saucers, um, I'm not sure what the one on the left is set on, but it's, it's up off the ground. The one on the right is sort of like a bird bath style, but it's been filled with that sand and the sand is just kept, uh, kept moist. So yeah, you can really get creative and have fun with this. And uh, a basking spot, a place, especially in the morning to wake up for butterflies or to uh, warm up, it can be really helpful. Um, just needs to be open and like an open low spot. And again, protected from wind, obviously sunny and a, a material that holds heat. That's especially good. So like rock or brick, um, a, a brick or hardscape pathway can work for that, right? Just a, a strategically placed pathway. So here are some examples of basking spots. On the left, it's a very elaborate one. I don't know where you get a rock with, or, or if you carve that out yourself, but it's basically a, a rock, a combined rock and like puddling spot or bird bath. So that's pretty cool. Um, on the right, here's a uh, red admiral. Um, basking on a rock, on a nice flat rock. And yeah, finally, and this is very important, right? You wanna avoid using pesticides and herbicides in your butterfly garden. Uh, a lot of natural organic pesticides are still designed to kill uh, caterpillars and butterflies, uh, like BT, spinosad, those are, those are big time caterpillar killers. So best to not use any chemicals. Evan, before you move on, I have a couple questions about puddling. Okay. Um, so do you, um, do you know, do all butterflies puddle? I don't know. You know, I'm not sure. I know with some, like sulfur specifically, males and females puddle. Whereas with swallowtails, it tends to be more males. And there can even be like parties of whole groups of sw uh, swallowtails puddling together, specifically the males. Um, but I'm not sure if they all do it. Right. I've seen a lot yeah. of pictures of sulfurs doing it. I've seen myself, the swallowtails doing it. Um, but that's, that's a good question. I don't know. 
Right. I've never seen like a blue or, uh, you know, some of these tiny butterflies doing it. That's yeah. a very good question. I have to look that one up. Okay. Yeah. And so also, um, do you know if there's a recommended ratio for if, if you're adding salt, like if you're creating a puddling station for, for butterflies, is there like a good salt ratio to add? You know, I don't, I don't know for sure, but I would say like, it doesn't need to be a time. Think about what's, you know, found in nature, right? In, on the edges of a pond, you know, as the water evaporates, maybe it leaves salt, but it's not like super salty, right? In a freshwater pond. It's not like, you know, the Great Salt Lake or something like that, right? It's not, it's not the ocean, right? Mm -hmm. You're getting this from fresh water. So I would say just like, you know, a, a good size pinch, I would think would be enough. Yeah. Okay, perfect. But you can experiment with that too, you know? Try a saltier setup and see if it attracts more butterflies. I don't know. I don't know how they sense the salt, how they find the salt, or if they just assume that wet mud will have salt. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think that was that was our, our puddling question. So thank you. Great. Okay. So um, yeah, now we'll move on to the plants. So we're going to be talking about native um, nectar plants first, and then we'll go into the larval food plants. So butterflies are, as I mentioned earlier, they're especially attracted to plants that have clusters of really small flowers. So a lot of the plants we're talking about will fit that description. Um, so we're gonna talk about a few different California buckwheats. These are especially good at attracting blues and hair streaks, that, those smaller um, butterflies that we talked about earlier. So especially those smaller ones, those, those are what I tend to see on buckwheats, but it attracts other butterflies as well. Um, and so yeah, just about any buckwheat should be a pretty good butterfly attractor. We're just gonna talk about three species, but there are many available um, in the nursery trade, there are many you can choose from. We're talking about sort of, um, well, California buckwheat is a fairly large one, but, you know, kind of medium to small. Um, but yeah, there's like, you know, Channel Island species that are great. But yeah, we're just going to talk about three. But yeah, basically any buckwheat, great for butterflies. Um, so California buckwheat specifically, this is ubiquitous in the coastal sage scrub, you know, near the coast. Um, it also grows way out in the desert into Arizona, you know, it's various varieties. It's pretty variable in form. There are, you know, it can grow six feet tall. It can be a ground hugging um, prostrate plant. And um, yeah, it's just basically one of the best wildlife plants you can grow. It attracts uh, beneficial wasps, bees, flower flies. And then, as I mentioned, the blues and hair streaks in terms of butterflies and then birds to eat the seeds. So, if you have uh, room for one plant for wildlife, you know, this is a good choice. And California buckwheat, you know, it survives around here, right? It dominates the ecosystems around here. It needs very little water once established, but it does tolerate some summer watering to keep it looking more green. So, um, you know, in my section of the garden, I, I don't specifically go out of my way to water buckwheat, but a lot of it gets monthly water and it looks, you know, half decent, you know, Water every two weeks will keep it maybe a little bit more green. Um, it's great as a mask, as we showed in that photo, as you saw in that photo earlier. It's a um, fairly late bloomer. It can st start in late spring, but it can get all the way, make it all the way to fall with, especially with some, a little extra water through the summer uh, to keep it going. And um, the flowers fade to a nice rusty red color. So, you really don't need to deadhead it right away for appearance. You can leave that nice sort of dried flower arrangement on there, that rusty red. And then, um, and then when it fades to more of a you know, grayish dark color, if you want, you can deadhead it. Um, but it's nice to leave those seeds on there for the birds uh, first. And uh, yeah, it's also the larval host for those same butterflies that like to visit the flowers for the blues, coppers, and hair streaks. Here's another uh, smaller form of buckwheat. This one is pretty popular in native gardens these days. So this is the red form of Variogonum grande. So it's variety rubescens, native to the Channel Islands. Pretty well behaved and, and short. So it's to about three feet wide, but only about a foot tall with the foliage. The flowers go about a foot above that. 
to maybe two feet or so, maybe a little taller. Nice dark green leaves, pale underneath, and this beautiful red color. Um, and then also summer bloomer into fall. So nice, nice for covering that late bloom period, kind of mid to late. And um, inland, like say, those of you, I think there's someone in Laverne, uh, definitely in Colton. Um, in inland areas, it benefits from a little extra water, even though it is pretty drought tolerant. So, you know, occasional summer water, like maybe every few weeks. Um, you can experiment with that, see if monthly keeps it green, might not be quite enough. Um, but it benefits from that inland and even a little bit of shade, although you want to keep it in a decent amount of sun to get the butterflies on it. And this is tolerant of clay for those of you who have clay soils. Deer don't eat it if you have to worry about deer. Um, again, and it hosts, it's not only a nectar plant, but it hosts those hair streaks and blues. Um, to sort of vary our, the flower colors with the buckwheats we're talking about, here's a yellow flowered buckwheat, um, sulfur buckwheat, Areogonum, Areogonum umbilatum. This is another extremely variable species. It ranges all the way up into central Canada, uh, east to Col Colorado to the Rockies. But what's generally available in the trade is about three in three inches tall and three feet wide with gray green foliage. It can be like a six foot shrub in some parts of its range, but what you're looking at here is basically what's available to buy. And um, it's normally found at high elevation, yet it's very heat tolerant. So it can take inland locations like, you know, where it's fairly hot in the summer, like Colton, like Claremont. You can also take really cold temperatures um, if you live at high elevation, which no one tuning in, in is, but um, one of our volunteers here, he grows it at 6,000 feet and it does great. And again, very drought tolerant, like most of the buckwheats, better with a little bit of extra water. So that means you can give it a little summer water out of season, right? Um, every few weeks. And that's something to experiment with. If, if you want a more sort of green, uh, um, want it to go, the buckwheats don't go super, super dormant, but they'll look you know, a little ragged in the summer. Um, experiment with that, some light summer watering and see how little you can get away with and keep it looking more green. And yeah, again, larval host plant for those blues and the metal marks. Next, we're gonna talk about sages. So this is the mint family um, sages are in, and these are another of the best, um, you know, another really good genus for attracting butterflies. Um, I've especially seen a lot of swallowtails on them lately at CBG. They're also great for bees and fantastic for hummingbirds. Hummer hummingbirds go insane for sages. So if you like hummingbirds, they're a good one to have around. Um, and especially from what I've read, it sounds like selections and hybrids of the Cleveland sage, Salvia clevelandii, are some of the best for attracting butterflies. These typically have like a bluish to blue, you know, violet purple flower. Um, Alpine, what you see here on the left with the hummingbird visiting it, is a selection of Cleveland sage, the Clevelandii. Um, it's about two to three feet tall by five to six wide. You know, pretty widely available, very tolerant of different soils, very drought tolerant. Might still, I haven't observed this one to see how it does like with, you know, no summer water to see, it, see if it still looks good. But it's another one to experiment with where you can try some light summer watering just to keep it looking fresh. Because um, a lot of the sages will go pretty dormant in the summertime. And uh, this one has a very long bloom season. It can be from May to December even some years in uh, good conditions. So nice recovering, basically covers the whole season, spring through fall in, into winter, if you're lucky. Uh, here's another, this is a hybrid of Cleveland, Cleveland sage with purple sage called Pozo Blue. This came from, was uh, developed at Las Palitas, a, a native plant nursery in the uh, central coast. Um, they've, at Las Palitas, they've observed 30 different butterflies using this plant. They're out in sort of a semi-wild area. So in an urban areas, we might not get such a diversity, but it's worth a try, right? Um, grows to about four by four. Again, tolerant of most soils, very drought tolerant. But, um, you know, water every two weeks. You can try once a month and still through the summer and see if it still stays looking fresh if you don't want it to go um, more dormant and kind of 
the leaves tend to tend to shrivel in the summertime with the sages. And this one has a shorter bloom seen about six weeks in spring. Um, a great early blooming sage is black sage. This is another dominant plant in the coastal sage scrub community. Um, very, you know, very dominant, lots of black sage in, co in the coastal sage scrub. Um, grows within like 50 miles of the coast from San Francisco south. Um, usually in bloom by March, but sometimes can bloom earlier. They're still in bloom now. We have kind of a late spring happening. A lot of the black sages in my area are still in bloom right now in June. But yeah, good early bloomer. Flowers kind of range from white to purple. Grows to about three by three, and then more slowly it can get sometimes 10 feet wide, but in my experience, at least the plants I care for, few of them are that big, more like maybe, I don't know, six feet wide. Um, but it goes very dormant in summer without extra water. But yeah, every two weeks, two to three weeks, we'll keep the plants kind of half green if, if you choose. And um, yeah, and there's some prostrate selections that are good as kind of like tall ground covers of this one. Terra seca is one we have in the garden. A little sir is another. So um, it kind of varies in form, which is nice. Those are only one to two feet tall instead of three or more. This one's also, the seeds are fantastic for quail. If you live in the kind of the wildland inter interface, um, finches, other birds just go crazy for the seeds. So it's nice to leave the, um, the old flower heads on there until the birds have had a chance to get the, get those seeds and then you can deadhead if you choose. Coyote mint. So Kristen mentioned coyote mint. I've already mentioned coyote mint. This is another of absolute top butterfly plants. So this is another mint family plant, hence the name. It's a sub shrub, so kind of a, a soft, a soft, small shrub that's kind of woody at the base. I think it smells, the way I describe it is, I think it smells kind of like a citrus soap that I want to eat. I don't know, for some reason, that's what I think of with this one. It smells good, but it also smells soapy um, in a nice way, really fragrant. You can even smell it at a little bit of a distance, these rounded clusters of lavender pink flowers and blooms in late spring um, into the summer. So they're kind of coming into, they're kind of half in bloom now and coming into full bloom in the garden here. We have some nice masses of this at CBG that are great butterfly attractors. And um, yeah, about two to three feet tall by about three wide. And great, great for bees. I was recently at the LA County Arboretum and they had this in their bee garden with lots of bees visiting it. You'll also see hummingbirds on this somewhat. It's not the best hummingbird attractor, but you'll see them on it as well. Yeah, great mass as a mass ground cover. It's a tolerant of clay if you've got heavy soil. Um, it will go kind of semi-deciduous in late summer. With frequent light waterings, it can be kept from going dormant. And um, you can cut this back in late fall. It seems to put out more growth, leafy growth, kind of in the winter time or like maybe early spring. I made the mistake of cutting one up back at home as spring started and it didn't really, it wants to bloom then. It doesn't really want to put out leafy growth. So fall is the time to cut it back. Um, and it makes a great tea. You know, Native Americans in California use this as a, uh, a um, cure for upset some stomach, sore throat. It's really nice to have around for that. Coyote brush. So this is um, <clears throat> the ground cover versions of coyote brush, or some call it coyote bush, um, have been become especially popular. You see those in a lot in uh, public landscaping, sometimes in, in people's yards. Um, the, you know, just the natural straight species can be three to six feet tall, kind of varies in form. It's not necessarily the most attractive plant, um, you know, a full-size coyote um, brush, but absolutely fantastic for pollinators, um, especially for the native skipper butterflies. Predatory wasps attracts a lot of different like pollinator flies too, for some reason. Um, so it's something you can maybe put in the back of a, a garden, and if you have it near a sitting area, kind of like in the back of the garden by a sitting spot, you can really sit and enjoy that, um, you know, wildlife TV, that wildlife, that show put on by the pollinators. Um, whereas, yeah, if you put it in, in the front of a garden, it can be, you know, maybe a bit unsightly for the front of a garden. It's very, very drought tolerant. It's a pioneering plant in a lot of plant communities towards the coast. 
Um, yeah, and there are ground cover versions. Um, <clears throat> other species you might try, especially if you have like a wet spot or are willing to give some extra water are some of these more riparian species. The salt marsh baccarus is supposed to be another fantastic um, pollinator attractor. And the mule fat, this is a very, very common in riparian areas. Also, you know, will grow a, a little ways away from water. Um, but yeah, those just both need quite a bit of extra water. Um, I forgot to mention, we've moved on to the sunflower family, the Asteraceae, that's uh, coyote brush, and the slender sunflower. This is a nice perennial sunflower, uh, two to six feet uh, tall by three to six wide. Tends to, without some extra water, tends to die back in late summer and can be cut back. Otherwise, it'll die back in winter and can be cut, you know, to within six inches or so of the ground. New growth will come from the base uh, in the spring. And if you deadhead the first show of flowers, you can get a second show. And um, I haven't seen a ton. Of, this is in kind of a windy spot at, at CBG where we have masses of this. Um, I always get out there when the wind is kind of picked up. So I haven't personally seen a ton of butterflies on it, but Basically, wherever you read about this plant, it's mentioned as a great butterfly attractor. So maybe in a more protected spot, you'll see more butterflies on it. But it's a very nice one. So another aster family plant. Here we have California aster. This um, spreads by underground rhizomes to create a clump. So give it space. It, um, it's a great late bloomer. This one is one of the latest blooming native plants. So it's great to fill that late fall uh, spot. And um, yeah, it's a foot and a half to three feet tall with about, these flowers are about two inches across. And um, you can, tr you could try deadheading to see if you, it increases flower production, but it has such a long season that shouldn't be an issue, right? But you can always deadhead for appearance as well. And in late fall or winter, after it's gone dormant, uh, you can cut it to the ground and it'll reemerge in the spring. Um, and you can keep it a little bit under control by keeping it drier. That's something to experiment as well. If you water it a lot, it will spread uh, much more vigorously. Um, another late blooming uh, sunflower family plant is the California goldenrod. This is really spectacular in bloom. Again, it's something that spreads um, via underground runners. So give it, again, give it a space. If you need, have a you know, big space you're trying to fill up, it's great for that. And yeah, bloom summer into fall, these beautiful yellow, um, flower clusters. And yeah, it's blooming when a lot of things have gone dormant. And it can take, you know, pretty dry summers, or it can take a little bit of water to boost it through. I find uh, the ones I care for, they definitely, they'll look kind of half dead if you leave them totally dry, right? But they'll still bloom in summer, but um, with a lot of kind of brown leaves and whatnot. So um, a little boost, especially when it's blooming, can be helpful. And um, this one attracts the bees, butterflies, beneficial wasps, um, all sorts of pollinators. Another late blooming, you know, one more to add to the list, another great uh, late blooming um, sunflower family plant is this Ericamaria. These are, oops. This is, um, maybe if you have kind of a background spot, with room for a big shrub, because it's not the most attractive when it's not in flower. It just kind of looks like this big rangy, thin leafed, um, kind of sparse looking shrub. But in bloom, it's just a real show. I, I have not had a chance to observe this myself, but um, people have reported finding 20 butterflies on one bush at the same time. So it has these pungent yellow blooms, late summer into fall, credible pollinator magnet, very, very hardy, hardy to at least negative 15 degrees, grows in some very cold places, um, dominates a lot of, you know, sort of like sagebrush step in the um, kind of great plant, uh, sorry, uh, great basin area. Yeah, very, very tough and likes good drainage. Um, at the top of, at the very top of the list for butterfly plants, along with the coyote mint we mentioned, the salvias, the buckwheats, this verbena is just one of the best for attracting butterflies. Has a really long bloom season, has the most flowers in spring, but 
has some flowers kind of through, through a lot of the year. This was collected off of, uh, on Cedros Island off the west coast of Baja, but it's generally um, called a California native. It's, I don't know if it's technically in the California floristic province, but um, it comes from a summer dry, mostly summer dry climate and works very well for attracting our local wildlife. Um, yeah, it's about two to three feet tall by three to four wide. You can see it just looks spectacular combined with um, other bright colors, you know, like these bright oranges and bright blues and the red of the, of the door on this, on this uh, house. You can shear it lightly in fall to give it a more dense form if it gets a bit rangy. And inland, it, it likes a little bit of afternoon shade, but we, we grow ours in pretty full sun and it does okay. Um, and yeah, it's just great for butterflies. We've seen, oh, what have I seen lately on this? The funereal dusky wings, the monarchs, swallowtails, um, a, a unidentified lady butterfly I didn't get a great look at, the white butterflies. It's just like one of the best things you can grow for butterflies. And uh, I've included one tree, butterfly attracting tree. You've already seen uh, numerous pictures of butterflies nectaring on this plant. This is uh, the California buckeye, Aeschylus californica. Can grow up to 40 feet, but 15 feet is more common. Um, it does need some extra water to be in leaf for you know, more than half of the year. <laughs> in Claremont inland, where it's you know, hot and dry, it, it can be dormant for like half the year. So in, in, I have plants, trees that are already yellowing and dropping leaves. Um, and uh, in a lot of places where it grows in the wild, it does grow near water. So with moderate to regular water, it'll, it should stay and leave through the summer and then drop its leaves in the winter, um, which you know reemerge in the spring. And um, it has these nice big clusters of of, um, of flowers that the, the butterflies adore. And um, there's actually a pink flowered um, uh, variety called uh, Canyon Pink that we have at the garden. So some of those pictures I showed you of swallowtails were taken on, on that Canyon Pink. And uh, yeah, it's just a great, uh, if you can find the space for it, the white trunks, even when it's lost its leaves can be very attractive, especially with a little bit of aesthetic pruning. Um, it, it, can look, it can actually look pretty nice. So don't despair if it drops its leaves. So those are the nectar plants. I've compiled them into a, um, a chart here that shows early, mid-season, and late bloomers. And, um, and also included here are some platter plants we didn't have time to cover, like some of the annual wildflowers you might try. Those are especially good for it, the early season. Um, but yeah, to create a butterfly garden from scratch or to integrate plants into your existing garden, you would just want to choose plants from each of these bloom periods so that you cover as long of a season as possible. So that's, that's really the idea to cover from spring through the fall so you can have butterflies, you know, really consistently. So um, maybe we can email this to people, Kristen. Yeah, so we'll, we'll provide yeah. this to you. Yeah, definitely. I can I can email that to everyone. So, perfect. Great. Um, yeah. So a little bit of uh, and we mentioned most of this along the way, but you can extend the bloom season with some of these plants with uh, by deadheading and with giving them extra water. So here in the garden, I especially things that are putting on their show in spring, when it's still in our when we would naturally get rainfall, that's when I water extra, not in the summer. So I still a lot of things do get. Um, maybe like monthly water in the summer. But in the spring is where I really try to give the plants a boost, especially the ones that are putting out flowers. So that's something you can kind of play around with. Um, say that, that works very well for ribes, spring, you know, like the, the currants. Um, not something we cover here, but just as an example. Um, but yeah, some extra water for the spring, spring bloomers can really help to get that bigger flower show. And um, you can play around a bit with deadheading. Um, I, I never, I haven't tried deadheading salvias at, you know, just as the flowers fade to see if that really extends the bloom period. Typically I leave the flowers on and let, let birds and come in and get, and get those uh, seeds. Um, but you can play around that and see if 
see if that um, extends that bloom, bloom period on the salvias. Um, yeah, and as I mentioned with like the, sun, the slender sunflower, you can deadhead those and get a second flower show. Um, buckwheat, same thing as the flower stalks fade, you can cut, cut them, but it's nice to leave that the, at the end of the season, it's nice to leave those final flowers on there, let them mature seeds and let the birds come and eat the seeds. Then after that, if you choose, you can deadhead them. Um, yeah, so we're gonna move on now to some larval food plants. Um, so these are, yeah, plants to provide this, this can attract some, um, help you to attract some butterflies you wouldn't see otherwise. So yeah, let's jump right in. So this is a really cool one. This attracts a very exotic, interesting looking butterfly. Um, so yeah, this is the California pipe vine, Aristolochia californica. This is our only native larval food plant of the pipe vine swallowtail. And I'll show you some pictures of that butterfly in a sec. It's really spectacular. This top photo here was taken at CBG, like I think maybe 10 years ago. We used to have a really big patch of this. Um, and my coworker told, who was here at the time told me there was basically a plague of these pipe, pipe vine swallowtails. Um, so although I mentioned, uh, you know, don't worry about caterpillars decimating your plants, apparently there were, it attracted so many that they were e able to eat through this whole patch. And the plant is actually much smaller now than it, than it used to be, and it's still, uh, still recovering. Um, but it also gets really minimal water. It, it would really prefer, they often grow near streams. Um, with, with extra water, it probably would recover much more quickly. But this is a huge vine um, for those of you who have larger properties, larger yards. Um, it can be up to 20 feet. I've heard of it, um, just uh, uh, reports of it growing up to 50 feet, clambering into uh, trees. And this is native, yeah, to the Bay Area, Sierra foothills, often in riparian areas, often in more shade. So our patch, even a lot of shade, still attracted the pipeline flying swallowtails. So if you have a back corner or something, you could stick one of these in, um, it might be worth a try. But yeah, just be warned, it's a very, very big plant. And yeah, it has these goofy kind of pipe-shaped, one-inch um, purple striped flowers, which apparently have a scent kind of like carrion that attracts these, um, you know, these pollinators, I believe flies that are attracted to the smell of carrion. And I think tricks them into pollinating. They think they're getting some rotten meat. Um, and this will, uh, is winter deciduous. It also die back <coughs> um, in the summer, summer without extra water. But this is something you probably want to want to give moderate water to for it to be happy. And, but yeah, shade is actually, seems to be okay for this one, at least inland. Still attracted to butterflies. But yeah, maybe like at least a few hours of sun. And yeah, here are the pipevine swallowtails. They're really, really gorgeous. Um, and in the bottom right, you see it has a very odd looking caterpillar with those kind of red spines. Very cool. So here's deerweed. This is um, pretty neglected, I'd say, in native plant landscaping. But this is a pioneer um, legume uh, bean family plant uh, found in drier parts of California and Arizona. You'll see it definitely inland here. You see it all over the place. Um, I mean, it, ha it has a very large range. And it's got small little pinnate, pinnate leaves, which have little tiny leaflets. And they, they drops those leaves with drought and, um, and during the winter. So this is something that it will look mm, kind of half dead without some extra water. But again, that extra water through the warm season, if you so choose, if you want to improve its appearance. Um, yeah, maybe every few, might be able to get away with every few weeks. I, I haven't really tried it, but it, it still goes dormant with monthly water. Um, yeah, and it's best, yeah, and you get the, the flowers kind of March into summer which are great for pollinators as well, great for bees. And it's best used kind of as a background plant. And um, yeah, this is a host for all sorts of things. Uh, blue butterflies, hair streaks, a lot of the sulfurs, those yellow species, and many species of moths. So it's, yeah, it's a host to all, uh, a wide variety of species. Um, this is another bean family plant, the astragalus. I love the name of these, loco weed, uh, crazy weed. And um, you have a few, um, there are a few species available in the nursery trade. At, on the top here, we have Nuttall's milk fetch. fetch. I believe this one is a, a yeah, this was a, is a coastal species. I don't think anyone tuning in lives right on the coast, but 
Uh, if you have that salt spray and stuff, that's a good choice. The Pomona Loco weed on the bottom, that um, gets to about three feet tall by five wide. So pretty, pretty good size. Um, pretty attractive, especially with a little extra water. They can look you know, fairly ratty with just occasional water. So that's something to keep in mind. If you want a nice appearance, you're gonna have to give it more water. Um, but uh, that Pomonensis, that plant, that uh, photo on the bottom, that one's actually available from Theodore Payne as seed. So you could even create a mass of this. Well, it's a larval plant, so you don't necessarily want to mass it. But anyway, you can you, seed is available for that one, which is pretty cool. And it's got these beautiful compound leaves with many uh, oval leaflets. And then uh, most, a lot of species of of these loco weeds have kind of cream colored flowers, but they come in other colors as well. And then they have these leguminous pods that dry to a nice papery texture, which can be kind of attractive. So they're a fun one. And yeah, yeah, it's host um, to uh, a lot of blue butterflies and a lot of sulfurs, especially. Uh, so yeah, we mentioned the California dog face earlier. This um, is the California false indigo, the Lamorpha californica, uh, its uh, host plant. So we have this where our butterfly pavilion used to be. We have one of these planted. Um, this is a pretty large shrub to over six feet. And it's a, uh, as, as I mentioned, host plant to the dog face. And it prefers some shade, but we have them growing in pretty full sun and they do okay. Um, but with a little extra water, uh, that can be helpful. And then they do lose their leaves in the winter time. And, um, could be a nice background sh shrub for a butterfly garden. Um, it's not a great wind blocker though. This, this picture makes it look pretty uh, dense, but um, the ones I care for anyway are pretty open in their habit. They're not gonna block a lot of wind. So not a great wind, uh, you know, wind protection hedge, but um, pretty attractive and interesting looking flower clusters. Um, Ceanothus species, uh, a variety of Ceanothus species are very popular in gardens these days. And they're like champion butterfly host. Um, various Ceanothus species host spring azure, uh, you know, type of blue butterfly, echo blues, dusky wings, tortoise shells, swallowtails, hair streaks, and the Ceanothus silk moth that you see here in the photo, uh, which is pretty spectacular. And um, Ceanothus come in all shapes and sizes, you know, always with clusters of blue or purple or sometimes white flowers. So there's a Ceanothus to fit every space and set of conditions. Although most like sun, most are pretty sensitive to summer water. You don't wanna give them too much in the summer. Um, most you can get away with um, like once a month. And um, I should mention Calscape. If you look up any California native plant on the calscape.org website, as one of their little mm, growing parameters, they'll tell you how much summer water a plant can tolerate. So that's really important for things that are sensitive to summer water. Um, they tell you like what the maximum is. And so you probably don't want to want to more, you know, whatever they say is the max, watering more than that in the summer and the plant might decline and have a shorter lifespan. So that's something to keep in mind. So you can get away with some summer water, with a lot of these things to keep them looking nicer if that's a concern. And uh, the low blue blo blossom, the Ceanothus thursiflorus, far thursiflorus, is an especially um, good nectar source as well. Uh, I've never seen butterflies on this, but I've read multiple places that it's a good butterfly attractor. So it might be worth a try. But this one inland does like more shade. So might be better in partial sun. You could try to, because it'd be nice to have it in sun to get those um, nectaring butterflies. Um, otherwise, yeah, you might get more, more caterpillars and fewer nectar, nectar, uh, nectar, uh, nectaring butterflies. Um, but yeah, you want to keep the water minimal in summer. And this one blooms winter to spring. So it really covers that year, uh, early period well. And it's kind of a, like a high ground cover. Um, cobweb thistle is another really cool butterfly host. It hosts checker spot, crescent, and lady butterflies. This is the form that we have that sees itself at CBG. If you look up pictures, um, there are several different varieties of this. 
and the form can vary quite a bit. This one has kind of a deep pinky red flower. Um, I really like this form. I, I don't remember if this one is var venu, uh, variety venusta or something else. I'd have to check. I, I, don't, I don't know exactly, but um, they're pretty, pretty cool looking plants. And they're also used as a nectar source, especially swallowtails, monarchs, California dogface, um, and hummingbirds like it as well. So it's a, a really great one to have around, but it is an annual or a short-lived perennial. And typically after it puts out a big flower show, then it'll disappear and you can pull it out. Um, but yeah, let it go to seed and seed, seed more of itself. Um, and yeah, just be careful touching, you know, use some uh, leather gloves when you touch this one. It's pretty pokey. And it prefers well-drained soil and like to naturalize, you know, 10 to 20 inches of rain in the winter. Um, you know, no one here is getting less than that rainfall. But in a year like this, probably not going to do much of a show unless you give it some extra water. And uh, oaks are a kind of underappreciated um, caterpillar host. They're host to the California sister, like we mentioned earlier, um, various dusky wings and hair streak butterflies. And oaks, if you can include one in your yard, are just fantastic wildlife plants all around. They're kind of, uh, you know, keystone species in a lot of the, um, meaning that um, a lot of wildlife species depend on them for survival. They provide shelter and acorns. They attract all sorts of other insects and birds. And I included this leather oak um, in this talk because it's small enough to fit in many gardens. It only gets about 12 feet tall and fairly slowly. So it's considered a scrub oak. And it's very drought tolerant, although it does appreciate a little extra during, especially during droughty winters like this one. So you can make up for that low rainfall by watering the winter and um, uh, early spring. Um, and then a few waterings to get through the dry season is helpful too. Ones that I ignored through the dry season here, they start to look a little sad by fall, right? I mean, it's natural, but for appearance, you could you know, give a monthly water in the summer and it might be okay. But yeah, you wanna keep it summer watering to a minimum with oaks. So to end this talk, briefly, I just wanted to, I know a lot of people are coming to butterfly gardening or some, some of you in this talk maybe uh, are coming to uh, butterfly gardening with a concern about monarchs, you know, having heard the news about their, their, their plight, their declining population. Um, so I'm gonna talk just real briefly to end the talk about the monarch's plight and how you can help monarchs. So the problem with monarchs right now, they've suffered drastic population losses in recent years. The Eastern migration, that's the butterflies uh, east of the Rockies that migrate um, and overwinter in central Mexico in pine forested mountains there. They're down by 80%. The Western migration, that's our butterflies, that's down 99% from about uh, you know, close to 5 million in the 80s to like only 2,000 were uh, counted in 2020 at the overwintering sites along the coast. Yeah, so our butterflies overwinter on the California coast. There are a few spots in Baja as well from about Mendocino south. There are something like 400 spots. Um, some of them have not seen very many monarchs in years. And a lot, the count last year was zero. There just were none there. <clears throat> and the reasons for this decline um, that are you know, mentioned in, in when you read about them are loss of the breeding habitat. That's loss of milkweed and places to uh, lay their eggs and have their caterpillars develop and turn into butterflies and destruction and deg degradation of the overwintering sites and climate change. So how can you help? Well, the best way to help monarchs is to plant locally native milkweed. Um, although there's kind of a caveat with that, the Xerces Society recommends not planting any milkweed within five to 10 miles of an overwintering site. Um, and I, didn't, I don't have the exact link here, but the Xerces Society website, which I um, have in the resources page for this talk, they have an interactive map where you can, you can look at all the butterfly overwintering sites. And so you can see if you live near one. So if you're close to one of those, best not to plant milkweed. <clears throat> They're all pretty close to the water. So if you're inland, you don't, it's not something to worry about. And um, this tropical milkweed you see in the picture here, this has become um, very, very popular in landscaping these days. There's some of it right down here on Foothill Boulevard 
uh, close to where uh, close to the CBG. Um, the problem with this um, exotic milkweed is that it causes the, a dangerous buildup of this protozoan parasite, which is abbreviated OE. Because it doesn't die back in the winter, the foliage get, builds up more and more of that protozoan, which then the caterpillars eat. And monarchs that have a lot of this parasite tend to have um, worse success migrating. They tend to be just generally less healthy, smaller, don't have as much mating success. Basically, they're just like way more unhealthy. So it, can, it could cause, in theory, like decline, you know, in the population. So best not to plant that one. Um, if you already have it um, and you're not willing to rip it out, you can just keep it totally cut down to the ground through the winter. Um, that also will revive the, you know, get rid of that parasite, get rid of that old foliage. You won't have that, um, that buildup of the parasite. It also prevents monarchs from, since it's, it's, doesn't die back in the winter, it also prevents monarchs from, or they think it prevents monarchs from leaving and going to their overwintering sites. They need that cue of the plants dying back to know it's time to go, which all of our native milkweeds die back in the winter. So here's a selection of what we have locally native in Southern California. If you're not in the desert part of Southern California, um, we've got the woolly pod, the really fuzzy leafed one. Uh, California milkweed is also a very fuzzy, <clears throat> With a bit more pinkish flower. These are less commonly grown, maybe a little trickier to grow. To grow. Um, the Areocarpa is um, really likes to spread. It does. It seems to do well in very well-drained sandy soil, uh, but it will spread to make a clump. So it's sort of like invasive in a garden. That's something to keep in mind. The Californica um, is a really nice woolly leaf. I'm not exactly sure where this is available to buy. It might be a little hard to find, but it's worth a try. Um, and then the narrow leaf. That's the I would say the easiest to grow, the one I would recommend trying. So we're gonna talk about that in a little more depth. Here's the narrow leaf milkweed. These can grow to, shoot, we have a, a patch in the garden where they're probably like four and a half feet tall, but that's a really well-established clump that's getting a little extra water. And in clayish soil, that holds the water a little bit better. It's the easiest to grow. It tolerates the clay soil, but also does okay in fast draining soil. Um, but it can take a little while to establish, so you want to be patient. And it's worth planting, you know, a mass to begin with. Then you get a nice substantial clump. Um, it will also reseed itself. <clears throat> the flowers uh, fly in the wind, and so will travel long distances. But you also get some sprouting up probably in your own yard um, close by. It does benefit benefit from some extra water. Um, and then it does die back in the winter, which is important for the monarchs, right? That's their cue to fly to the coast. Um, the, those stems as they die, <clears throat> or once they die, can be cut down to like four inches or so. Um, we typically wait until an individual stem dies before cutting it. Um, and then, yeah, shoots will reemerge from the ground in spring. And um, <clears throat> milkweeds are not only great for, as a monarch host, but they're great attractors for all sorts of other beneficial insects. So they're great for, um, you'll see some interesting pollinator wasps on them, <clears throat> as well as other butterflies. Um, so yeah, great as a nectar source as well. So some resources to help you in your butterfly gardening endeavors. The Xerces Society is an organization dedicated to invertebrate conservation in general. They're a great place to look if you're interested in what's going on with monarchs, how you can help with monarchs, uh, where the overwintering so sites are to go see monarchs or to see if you live near one. So if you go to Xerces.org, look at their monarch resources and you'll be linked to all sorts of interesting information about them. Uh, Los Politas Nursery, they have a great butterfly gardening page with pictures of butterflies and information about specific species, uh, plant lists, an extensive plant list that shows what Native plants attract what butterflies. So that's um, I've included that link there. Calscape is great. They have information on just about any um, native plant you'll, you would ever think to grow. And they include information about maximum uh, summer water that plants will tolerate. They include information about what butterflies and, um, and moths are hosted by that plant. So a wealth of information there. They also show the range where it grows naturally in the state. Um, Calflora is a resource for looking at um, where plants have been observed throughout the state. That's the data that Calscape shows on their site. 
So that CalFlora is really useful for identifying plants in the wild. <clears throat> they have a what grows here function you can use to um, see a list of plants that grow in a specific area you're, you're looking at. So it's great for like when you're out on a hike. Um, I forgot to include it here, but iNaturalist is great for that too. That's becoming more and more popular. So iNaturalist, I think, .com. They also have an app. That's a great one for getting help identifying things. You can post things you see, photos you see, and people will offer you IDs. It's kind of a crowdsourced um, you know, plant or butterfly identification. Um, Native Here Nursery uh, is in the Bay Area, but they also have an extensive list of California native plants and what butterflies they attract. I forgot to include here another great resource for butterflies and moths, uh, sorry, for butterflies is butterfliesandmoths.org. So when we send you resources, we'll include that one. But that again is like, a, if you want to get involved in citizen science, that's where they compile data of, um, of you know, butterfly sightings. And so that can be great for identifying things as well. And um, yeah, a few books, and we'll send you this list, but um, an introduction to Southern California butterflies, it's Cal Southern California specific. Um, the second book, I used an older version of that for a lot of the research for this talk. Field guides are great for learning to identify butterflies. And um, this one here, this is the bottom one on the list. We sell this, um, but this is like a pamphlet that's um, the Butterflies of Southern California, a guide to common and notable species. Um, this is really useful as a quick reference for identifying butterflies. So yeah, that's it. Um, so we can, yeah, we can check in and see if there are any, any more questions. Yeah, great. Thank you so much, Evan. Um, you know, as you were talking, so much of that was like resonating with me as things that I had seen. So it kind of harks back to your beginning, you know, statement of, you know, just observe, 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 and you'll kind of start to pick these things up naturally too. Um, but we do have a couple questions. Um, okay. So uh, one of our participants is wondering if your milkweeds, they get totally covered with aphids, which they typically do. Is it better to just leave it alone or cut it down? Or what do you recommend for that aphid infestation? <clears throat> Yeah, so it's not it's not something you really need to worry about. Um, they pretty much always get that. I don't remember if it's actually a, a species specific to milkweeds. It may be, um, but yeah, it's not something you need to you really need to worry about. It's something yeah, it's something you can really just ignore and yeah, and wait for um, uh, you know natural predators to to move in and, and take care of them. Yeah, does that person, um, well, I mean, they can put in the chat, do, do they notice a noticeable decline in the health of the plants or is this kind of uh, preemptive? Um, yes, a decline. Oh, okay. Um, but yeah, I would, again, gardening for butterflies, um, yeah, best to wait for natural predators to take care of the problem. Something I have done, and I don't know if this is okay, but um, I've just given them, I guess, quick blast of water to kind of just knock a good portion of these aphids off. Or if it's really bothering you, you can put gloves on and kind of just scrape them. Yeah, off. Kind of, yeah and I guess, I guess it depends on whether if this is an established plant or like a newly, um, a newly establishing plant. Because in that case, yeah, if it's a really brand new plant, it might be helpful to uh, not have that pressure from aphids, right? Because it can really kind of stunt plants as, as they're trying to get going. So yeah, to be fair, if it's, if it's something you're trying to get established and it's kind of slowing down its establishment, um, yeah, blasting off with a hose or yeah, just like uh, gently rubbing them off with your fingers or yeah, with gloved hands, um, that can work. But yeah, typically typically when I feel the need to control aphids, it's yeah, a blast from the hose works great. Yeah. And it's chemical free. And you can give the plants extra water as you do it. Yeah. Right. I don't, I, so their follow-up question is to, my, to that was if that will, blast off some of the monarch, monarch larva as well. And well I, yeah, yeah, it would. <laughs> yeah, so, um, yeah. yeah. You could do it. So monarch caterpillars, once they get going, are pretty good size. So you'll, they're, they'll be very noticeable and you'll see them, right? And so um, I would just, yeah, just be careful not to blast the actual caterpillars. 
and check carefully for small cat, you know, very small caterpillars. Yeah. So that's why it's best to kind of avoid for now, you know, in the caterpillar season. But yeah, careful blasting with the hose. Um, but yeah, you could you could also be blasting away uh, eggs that are hard to spot, right? Right. That the monarch has laid. So um, I would wait and see. It's it's unlikely to kill your plant, right? It'll it'll. Um, but yeah, you can experiment a little with 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 hose blasting. Yeah. Careful, careful hose blast. Or yeah, use your fingers. Yeah, I think that's a good call to be carefully, not just kind of blindlessly doing it, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. If, if you do want the monarchs to, to use it. Yeah. Right. Um, and so uh, another question is, can you use BT or neem in other sections of your garden? Like not on your your larval or larva, larva food or host plant or nectar plants? but like in, uh, on other plants in your garden? Or do you think that will have an effect? Um, it, I mean, it depends on how far away it is, but they're getting, you know, and how careful you are with spraying, right? If you're spraying a whole tree and there's likely to be a lot of drift, um, then I would say, and it's close by, I would say probably not a, not a great idea. It's kind of a case by case thing. If it's far away um, in your garden, then yeah, you're, you're probably not gonna affect any any caterpillars, but it's really a case by case um, thing because yeah, like spinosad or BT is very effective at killing caterpillars. So, and it might be worth checking and seeing if that thing you want to spray is also a host. I mean, because um, if it's hosting something that you want to support, then maybe, you know, find out what species that is that you're spraying for. If you're spraying for caterpillars specifically, and maybe that's something you can tolerate. Yeah. Okay. At least to um, a certain level of damage. Right. Just and, something to think about. Okay. Um, and so do you know if praying mantis eat the, uh, you know, caterpillars, so larval stages of butterflies? I would think so. I don't know how they're affected by the same toxins as say birds. You know, because like, for example, monarch caterpillars are toxic to birds because of they eat the toxic milkweed. Right. Um, so I don't know, like, whether a, a praying mantis can eat monarch caterpillar, for example. Um, that's a good question. I would imagine that praying mant mantids are probably pretty generalist when it comes to what they eat. Um, you know, like whatever will fit in their mouths, mm -hmm. I, would, I would suspect. I don't think they're that picky. So I would think, yes, they probably would. Okay. Um, and then, so if you release ladybugs for eating the aphids that we were talking about earlier, do you think they might eat the monarch eggs? You know, I, I, I don't know. I'm not sure if they, I mean, I know they eat aphids and other um, bugs like that. I don't know if they eat eggs. I've Did never you heard of that. You have eggs, just eggs on there. Yeah, I've never heard of a, um, ladybugs eating eggs, but um, it just could be, I don't think it's something they would seek out, but um, yeah. Yeah, and as far as, you probably won't have, I mean, that also, also that population of ladybugs won't, probably won't stick around like as a huge population for that long. You know, they tend to disperse because, you know, the one milkweed plant can't support, you know, hundreds and hundreds of ladybugs at once, right? So. Um, and so we have a question. Of, um, so they, this person lives about a half mile to a mile from uh, the Bologna wetlands. Um, so about how many buckwheat plants should we plant to attract El Segundo blue butterflies? Or are they too far away to colonize our yard? Ooh. You know, I'm not sure how far away people see the El Segundo Blues. I wish I knew that off the top of my head. I think they're pretty localized. Um, but if you're there and you're that close to the coast, you might also try some coastal species of buckwheat. So like um, Areogonum cinereum, which is sometimes called coastal buckwheat. That's a really great one. It also works inland, but it's a, a nice coastal species that's native to like Malibu and Ventura, <clears throat> you know, not far away, you might try one of those coastal species and see if that's even more enticing to the 
El Segundo Blue. But off the top of my head, I don't know how far those range. I would think that if you got their host plant, the buckwheat, and good flowers for them, they might show up. But yeah, I, I, I don't know absolutely. That's very close to where they're spotted. Um, mm -hmm. But that whoever's asking that question, you can ask on, sorry, ask. You can look up on butterfliesandmoths.org and look at their page on the El Segundo Blue and see where people are spotting that butterfly. They have, you know, observations and you, you People may be spotting them in your neighborhood, who knows? Right. I think I looked at that and I forget exactly how big their range was, but it's definitely worth a try. Yeah, for <clears throat> sure. And yeah, I would, I would recommend that Cinerium. I mean, California buck, you know, fasciculatum, or the ones we mentioned today are great too, but Cinerium is a really great one. Okay, perfect. All right, well, I think that seems to be most, or pretty much all of our questions. Um, somebody did ask if we could show the book slide again um sure. if you want to just go back quickly but i just want to repeat that i will send all of this this list to you all in a follow-up email so you'll get that from me as well yeah yeah and i'll make sure to include uh the links i forgot okay <laughs> I, I wrote them down yeah. okay I great. Wrote them down, so we're good so well i think that concludes our class thank you everyone for joining us today and kind of gearing up to to be um butterfly um i was gonna say soldiers that's maybe not the right word but just sure, kind why not? Of, yeah, <laughs> yeah but and thank you evan for this was really a formative um you know a great class i think you covered the gambit of you know nectar plants and host plants and kind of just what we might spot out in our our neighborhoods and nearby our homes so um, it was really wonderful great i had a lot of fun too and everyone keep an eye out we might possibly do something in person uh, maybe a guided walk about butterflies or something in uh, in the recent in the upcoming future so, so somewhat recent or soon here we're not sure we're planning it but yeah hopefully hopefully yeah. we can get up great yeah thanks to everyone so much for tuning in i really uh, i really appreciate it i hope yeah. you uh, found it uh, useful definitely all right thank you everyone thank you evan have a good day you too. Bye, everybody.